Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Diego Rovetta. I'm the actual president of the EAG Local Chapter Netherlands. And uh, we are here for the last event of the year, uh, 2021. Uh, I'm co-hosting this event with uh, Dr. Rita Stray. And uh, uh, this time, uh, this event, as you may know from our previous communication, was initially planned to be live. Uh, but uh, due to the current circumstances uh, of the pandemic, uh, we uh, we couldn't uh, make it a live event. So uh, it's virtual like uh, all the other past events of the current year. Uh, but uh, we are quite uh, optimistic that uh, in the next months and uh, the situation could get better and in the next year we will have a live event again. For the time being, uh, we, we are here uh, virtually and uh, uh, this uh, time, uh, the introduction, the presentation of the introduction will be a little bit longer uh, because, uh, uh, as usual, we are uh, uh, welcoming all the AG community and giving the agenda of uh, today, uh, the WebEx uh, platform uh, rules for this meeting and the introduction of the speaker and the technical talk. Uh, but I will also give uh, a brief uh, review of uh, the achievement of the local chapter Netherlands uh, of the past year. So we start with uh, welcoming all our friends from the different uh, local chapter we are usually collaborating with. Uh, we have the London, Paris, Oslo, Aberdeen and uh, the most recent one, the Germany local chapter. So welcome to all of you. Uh, we are also commonly invited to our events and collaborating with the Oslo Society of Exploration Geophysicists and also with the student chapter of uh, EAG uh, in Delft Docks and in Aachen. So welcome to all of you. Uh, as usual, you can uh, be updated about uh, our events on our LinkedIn page. Uh, but also you can reach us out uh, through the uh, email address that you see in this slide. And uh, um, of course, uh, you are more than welcome to reach us out if you want to help us also in the organization of this type of events. And uh, we are always looking for more uh, uh, people to be actively involved uh, in the activities of the chapter. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, after uh, this uh, introduction and uh, a brief review of the current year achievements, uh, Rita will uh, introduce the speaker and the topic uh, of the technical talk on seismic noise and subsurface char characterization for gravity wave detectors by Professor Jo van der Brand, that I also welcome and thank for uh, his participation. And uh, after the technical talk, uh, Rita will also lead uh, the Q&A uh, and the discussion. Let's go to the 2021 uh, review. Uh, I want to give you some numbers about the local chapter. As you know, our local chapter is quite uh, new, is quite young. Uh, uh, it was established in June 2019. Uh, and so we have about uh, two years uh, and a half old. Uh, we have about 93 active members and 174 LinkedIn followers. Uh, this picture on the left uh, is uh, particularly important for us. This was the opening of our local chapter, uh, but uh, it's also interesting because it's a snapshot that we took from the uh, website of our uh, local chapter uh, that uh, will be uh, published and online pretty soon. I thank uh, Yuri uh, Brackenhoff that uh, designed this uh, website for us, and we will give you uh, communication as soon uh, as uh, it will be online. It will allow you to, to see all uh, uh, our uh, activities, uh, to register for activities, and also there will be an archive of the previous talks uh, of our contribution to the first break journal and link to the uh, previous talk on the EAG YouTube channel as well. Uh, this is the board member of uh, 2021. Um, I, I thank all of them because uh, all the achievement that I'm going to show you uh, won't be uh, reached without uh, the participation and the effort of uh, all of these people. Uh, of course, as well as your participation uh, to our all activities. Uh, but in terms of organization, these are the, uh, the main 
uh, people that contribute uh, to uh, the activity of the local chapter uh, the past year. And uh, in terms of achievements, uh, uh, we had uh, nine technical talks this year uh, on very different topics that are going from uh, geoscience and COVID-19 to decarbonization and energy transition. We had four different talks uh, on this topic. Uh, seismic interferometry in mineral exploration, AI, Bayesian imaging and monitoring, virtual reality in geoscience, as well as today, gravity wave detectors. We also organized a, a workshop on uh, uncertainty in geosciences. Uh, it was at the EAG annual meeting, also in collaboration with the local chapters of London and Paris. Again, this on the right is a snapshot of the EAG channel uh, on YouTube, uh, where you can uh, uh, look for our previous talks and they're uh, um, all registered and saved there. In terms of uh, uh, participation, uh, we had an average of uh, live participation, like uh, people attending on WebEx uh, of about 32 people along the year. Uh, you see different topics with the different uh, number of uh, people attending. And uh, we had uh, an average of 189 visualization on uh, YouTube of uh, the same talks. So pretty good achievement. And you see most of the uh, um, high participation was on talk on decarbonization and energy transition, of course, but also, for example, on other uh, old topic like uh, seismic interferometry uh, and uh, different other application. During the year, we collaborated with different EAG communities. Uh, apart the local chapters, the special interest communities in AI, decarbonization and energy transition, uh, mineral exploration, uh, but also women in geoscience and young professionals. Uh, we had collaboration with local and external societies like Gaia, the Oslo Society of Exploration Geophysicists, different university, uh, universities, uh, research institutes and consortia that uh, participated with uh, uh, some uh, speakers on different topics. At uh, UDELF, Eindhoven, Utrecht, uh, Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, Delphi Consortium, KNMI, uh, the student chapter that I already mentioned, and different companies that uh, they help us uh, with their uh, contributions, but also by proposing different speakers as well. And uh, uh, about collaboration, we will have more and more collaboration in the future. Uh, we are already uh, trying to establish a collaboration with UDELF uh, on uh, uh, new topics like uh, quantum computing, and uh, you will hear about this uh, pretty soon. All these achievements uh, gave us a prize. So, as you know, this year uh, the local chapter Netherlands was awarded as the best local chapter newcomer, and the prize, consisting in 1,000 euro, uh, was supposed to be used for this event, actually, uh, if it was uh, happened live, uh, but uh, it, it will be used for uh, future events as soon as uh, we will be able to make them live again. And now uh, I want to give you a, a first look at the uh, board for the next year. Uh, so we have uh, a couple of changes. Uh, there could be further legal modification to this uh, team. Uh, the main changes so far are the uh, new members uh, uh, that uh, joined our uh, board committee. Uh, one is Fairless Stein, uh, Steinhuisen. Uh, she uh, studied applied earth science and applied geophysics, and uh, she's currently the manager of operational maintenance team at Dunea. Uh, she will be uh, our media officer. And uh, also the second member that is joining us is Mike Blau. Uh, she also studied the applied geology and geophysics, uh, sorry, uh, earth sciences and geologies uh, at uh, Utrecht University, and she is uh, the head of the Department of Applied Geology and Geophysics at Deltares. Unluckily, we also have uh, to say uh, bye to a very valuable person, Panos Dulgeris. Uh, he was the previous uh, media officer. Uh, he's going to move to, well, he already moved uh, to, to Greece, uh, so he's going to live there and work there. Um, I think he's present, but uh, he cannot talk, so he sent me this sentence to share with you. It has been a great pleasure and honor to serve our community through my participation to the board. I've learned a lot and met wonderful people. 
I look forward to seeing the local chapter growing further in both numbers and activity in the years to come. And we also thank you, Panos, for your uh, incredible help, uh, and uh, we wish you all the best uh, for your uh, uh, life in Greece and also your career. Without uh, further ado, let's go to the technical part uh, of this presentation. Uh, first, uh, a few quick rules. Uh, during the presentation and also after, you can write uh, your question uh, in the chat. Don't use the Q&A because it's not currently working, but uh, you can type your question in the chat. And then Rita, uh, at the end, will read this question. Uh, we will also open the mic to have a more uh, live discussion. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I will pass uh, the mic to uh, Rita that uh, can start with the introduction of the speaker. Yeah, thank you, Diego, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm happy to welcome, yeah, first of all, welcome again from my side to everyone in the audience. And I'm happy to welcome today Professor uh, Dr. Johannes van den Brandt um, to give us a presentation on, um, on uh, gravity wave detectors. And uh, Jo van den Brandt is uh, dire director of the uh, subatomic physics group at the Freie Universiteit Amsterdam. He's been there since 1996. He specializes in uh, nuclear uh, particle and astroparticle physics. He has an impressive career of working uh, at particle accelerator accelerators all over the world. Uh, Stanford, MIT, Indiana University, Daisy in Germany, Heira, and uh, now in Amsterdam. He has initiated and directed uh, the gravitational physics program at NICEF. And uh, he also was a member of the detection committee of the uh, Virgo collaboration uh, that uh, uh, found the, that made the uh, groundbreaking observation of gravitational waves. The first one, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, something like three years ago or so. And um, he is, um, he, is co uh, he co initiated the Einstein telescope, which is a, fir a third uh, generation gravitational observatory. And um, now I'll give the floor to you, Jo, and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. I'll try to share the screen. So, I hope you can all see this. Looks good. Okay, good. So, what you see on the screen uh, here is uh, a future observatory for gravitational waves. And um, so you see a corner station here. It's all based on laser interferometry. And uh, from this corner to the next corner of this triangle is about 10 kilometers, and it's constructed underground. It is, uh, this device is on the European roadmap for future research infrastructure. And uh, it is an expensive device. The construction is estimated at the cost of about 2 billion euros. And there are several uh, candidate countries that would like to host this, um, this uh, instrument. Uh, one is Sardinia in Italy. Uh, there is an activity also in Saxony in Germany uh, to look at the possibility of hosting it. And another possibility right now, another candidate site is the Netherlands, and that's the border region with Belgium and Germany. Um, so, as I said, I'm from uh, the uh, VU University, Maastricht University, but I'm also um, uh, at NICEF, and that is the Dutch National Institute for Subatomic Physics in Amsterdam. So, let's first uh, discuss about gravitational waves. So, what are gravitational waves and uh, how can you uh, measure them? And um, then the future of this field, and that is uh, Einstein telescope. And then the possibility of hosting Einstein telescope in this uh, EU region, uh, Meuse Rhine. So that is the region, as I said, the border region of uh, Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And I will explain a bit more. So, first, what are gravitational waves? So, I think 
what, what you need to understand is that there are four fundamental forces in nature, but the main organizing principle in the universe is actually gravity. And if you now look at fundamental physics, you look at the um, most important open problems that we have in this, uh, in this field, they have to do with gravity. So in a sense, it's the least understood interaction. So when we take uh, the most precise data of the universe and we take our most precise model, which is general relativity, and we try to describe what we see, then you miss about 80% of the mass uh, compared to what you measure. So then we invent something that's called dark matter, but actually we don't know whether this is really matter that we are not observing and that we don't know what it is, or whether it's a failure of the theory of gravity. The other thing that we see is that um, uh, if you look at the um, uh, galaxies in the universe, the farther they are away, the faster they are accelerating, and this acceleration is increasing. And this is strange because gravity is an attractive force, and if anything, you would think it would slow down the acceleration between uh, galaxies. So that is what we call uh, dark energy. And so the dark means, again, that we have no idea what is happening here. And maybe it's signaling a breakdown of our, of, of our best theory, general relativity. So this is recognized as a tremendous um, uh, intellectual challenge. So people are working on this worldwide, uh, both on the side of theory and the side of uh, experiment. So when you hear about um, uh, string theory or quantum gravity, that is essentially trying to understand this because you have to combine general relativity with our quantum field theories. So if you want to describe the early universe, then particles were extremely close together, very highly energetic, and uh, essentially um, um, general relativity breaks down and quantum field theories don't have gravity included yet. Um, another system which is extremely difficult to describe actually impossible to describe uh, uh, is, uh, is a black hole, because in a black hole, um, particles uh, come to an end of their existence. So everything there disappears into a singularity. And that is what, what happens if you uh, believe general relativity, but uh, from a quantum point of view, that is very difficult to understand. So also from the, the, the experimental side, people are investigating that. So there are many missions in astronomy with uh, satellites, like the Planck satellite, looking at the cosmic microwave, microwave background, or Euclid in the future. Uh, people working at CERN or doing um, dark matter searches, for example, in Gran Sasso in Italy. But for the moment, we, we don't really understand that. Um, so in all these theories of, uh, of gravity, uh, the dynamical part is, are, are the gravitational waves. So here is Brian Green trying to explain that. They were to jostle the fabric of space-time. It should send out ripples in the fabric of space, and it's those ripples that we now call gravitational waves. Yeah, so uh, unlike um, uh, electromagnetic waves, which is a field that is uh, propagating through space and time, Gravitational waves are the um, deformations in space-time itself that are propagating at the speed of light. They are very small. They were predicted already in uh, 19, uh, uh, sorry, in um, uh, about 100 years ago in 1915, uh, but um, very difficult to detect. Um, all of space is filled with gravitational waves, but you only need, like electromagnetic waves, but you need to, to find a way to uh, detect them. Um, unlike electromagnetic waves, uh, the entire universe is transparent for gravitational waves. So that means that you can uh, look back, if you can detect in gravitational waves, all the way back to the Big Bang, to about 10 minus 34 seconds after the Big Bang. Uh, while with electromagnetic waves, you only can measure back to something like 300 or 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, so it might be our only chance to really uh, study the early universe. Um, we managed to do the first detection in 2015, and we, we announced that in 2016, and it had a quite significant impact on, on fundamental physics, astrophysics, astronomy, cosmology, and particle and nuclear physics. The first detections were made with uh, these kind of devices, so that is an interferometer. 
the length of the, this arm, an interferometer has two arms, a central laser and then two end mirrors. So the arm lengths are four kilometers. This one is built in the state uh, Washington in uh, Hanford. There is another one similar to this one in the state of Louisiana in uh, the US. And these were the two detectors that made the first detection. So it was recognized uh, already in 1964 by Ray Weiss and, and young professor at MIT uh, that it uh, may be possible to, to measure gravitational waves. So the challenge is shown here. So you need to, the, you, you measure a strain. So over a certain length, space will be stretched or you shrink it. But the uh, amount uh, that uh, it will change is delta L over L is in the order of 10 minus 22. So it's extremely small uh, changes in displacement that you need to measure. And the principle, you can do that uh, with lasers. That is what, uh, what Ray uh, discovered. And uh, it took uh, many years since his first idea. Uh, and then in 2017, he received the Nobel Prize for that, uh, for that achievement. Um, of course, to do something like this is, is extremely tough. Uh, first of all, uh, you have to make your optical components are to, uh, extremely precise. So these mirrors here, uh, this is a mirror of the LIGO interferometer. If you would amplify that mirror to the size of, let's say, Amsterdam, then the flatness of the surface is in the, the thickness of a human hair. So this is the closest you can get to a, a perfect mirror. And then you have to uh, position these mirrors stable on the level of about 10 minus 20 meter per square root of hertz. So what you need are uh, extensive vibration isolation systems in order to, uh, to make sure that seismic motion is not affecting the, uh, the position of the mirror. Otherwise, you cannot measure it. And there are many, many more things. For example, the stability of the frequency of the uh, lasers has to be at very, very high. Um, this is the sensitivity that uh, we achieved. And uh, already right now, we're doing better than that. So we can measure from about 10 hertz up to a few kilohertz, and then the uh, around a few hundred hertz, we achieve a sensitivity better, and so this is spe spectral density better than 10 minus 23 per root hertz, and um, we try to improve that with Einstein telescope. Uh, at 10 hertz, we are thinking about an improvement of uh, about four or five orders of magnitude. So in 2015, uh, this is what uh, happened. There were two black holes of about a billion light years away. They were circling and then melting together to form a new black hole. And that event is so powerful because these black holes have a mass of about 30 uh, suns, so 30 solar mass each. And they are uh, going around each other with uh, high frequency, so faster than the, your kitchen blender. Uh, and while the, the size of these black holes is about the size, uh, about a few hundred kilometers, and the green stuff that you see going there are these gravitational waves. So these tiny perturbations are the level of 10 minus 22 uh, or, um, um, uh, meters uh, divided by the, the length of the interferometer. And this is what happened when uh, they, these gravitational waves hit Earth. So this is a, a, the scale is a, a bit <laughs> exaggerated. But, um, um, and, it, and this all happened in the tenth of a second, and it was uh, uh, measured that, the, that displacement with uh, these detectors. Um, we worked on this for about uh, four and a half months to do data analysis to make sure that there was nothing wrong with the measurement, etc. And then this was uh, announced and uh, yeah, it made uh, the news uh, worldwide. And uh, um, immediately the year after, uh, the Nobel Prize was uh, was awarded uh, to this, which is kind of rare, because normally the, the Nobel Prize Committee always wants to be extremely certain of what they're doing. They don't want to make a mistake in awarding the Nobel Prize uh, uh, to uh, something that is not correct. And uh, half of the prize went to uh, Ray Weiss, who is the, the instrumentalist that uh, devised the uh, interferometers. This is uh, Kip Thorne. He got uh, uh, a quarter of the Nobel Prize. He's a theorist, and he did uh, a lot of the theoretical calculations. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, uh, Barry Barish. He, Barry was the one that uh, put the uh, whole uh, collaboration uh, together. 
Uh, this is a detector in Europe. So I've been working uh, already 15 years on, uh, on this detector. And uh, it has arm lengths of about uh, three kilometers. It's located near Pisa in Italy. And this uh, detector is uh, joining uh, LIGO and uh, doing uh, measurements uh, together. So the, the, the LIGO and, um, and uh, Virgo um, uh, instruments, so the free interferometers, have been doing free runs together so far. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Virgo was not ready to join the first run, which is a pity because, you know, <laughs> you miss out on the Nobel Prize if you do that. Uh, and there were three uh, de detections done in that, uh, in that year, in 2015. Then there was a run uh, the year after, in uh, 2017. And in that year, there were about uh, 10 uh, detections uh, done. And then uh, again, a year later, there was a run for a year and you see uh, many detections were done and in total right now, 90 events have been detected. And most of them are the collisions of uh, black holes uh, together. And uh, you typically see the chirp signal. So they start slowly rotating and then it accelerates and then it melts uh, together. Uh, you also see so that in the last run, there were many more events than in the first run. And uh, the reason for that is that we are constantly working on the sensitivity of the instruments. And if you improve your sensitivity by a factor of two, you can look a factor of two deeper in the universe. But the volume that you cover where you have the galaxies goes with the cube of that. So you immediately gain with almost the, um, the, the power to the third power. And that is what you see back in the event red. Now with Einstein telescope, we think we can do um, in a year something like 100,000 events. So uh, we can see the entire uh, universe. Another thing that happened, and uh, you, if you look back here, you see some events uh, that look different than uh, the typical black hole events. And that was the discovery of the um, uh, collision of two neutron stars. And neutron stars are the remains of, uh, of uh, uh, stars uh, after they run out of fuel, but they are, uh, it, it is very compressed matter. It is higher than the density in the nucleus. And you need uh, the, the physics of that matter is very, very extreme. If the density would be a little bit higher, you would uh, squeeze matter out of existence and you would create a black hole. Now, so we saw uh, that event in 2017, uh, also with, uh, with Virgo. I see uh, these neutron stars um, uh, orbiting each other. At the end, if the at merger, the frequencies was uh, more than a kilohertz. And then you see jets of, um, of uh, gamma rays um, uh, uh, ejected. And also uh, lots of um, uh, nuclear processes are happening here. And you, and you can look at that. So the beauty of this event is that not only with gravitational waves, you can see it, but you can also see it with normal telescopes. And, uh, and that uh, happened. Um, all the, the, the people that had access to telescopes, whether it were satellites or Hubble or Fermi or whatever, they all have been looking at that event. So that is what uh, happened so far. So the future is now um, Einstein telescope. So this is, as I said, this year it was placed on the uh, European roadmap and we are preparing for that. It's an underground uh, observatory because you can put it uh, underground. Uh, it is not a normal telescope that you put on a mountain because you're not looking electromagnetically. And this, this um, collision of black holes are the most violent e um, uh, events in the universe. Uh, more violent uh, than, than any of the gamma ray bursts that you see. But electromagnetically, you don't see anything. It's only seen by the distortion in space time. And uh, these gravitational waves go straight through the Earth. Now, with that uh, device, so with the current detectors like Virgo, Kahira, you only can look uh, a few billion light years deep in the universe. With, with Einstein telescope, you can look so far even before the existence of the first stars. So uh, into the dark ages of the of the early universe. And uh, hopefully it will be operational somewhere in 2035. And then with all the other instruments that are available in astronomy, we will do joint measurements. For example, with KM Freenet looking at neutrinos, but with Euclid and other uh, instruments looking at the electromagnetic pictures. And of course, uh, you will have uh, the James Webb telescope uh, being launched. 
Now, this is uh, Einstein telescope and uh, this cartoon in the form of a triangle. You will have six interferometers, and this length here is 10, 10 uh, kilometers. Um, it will have about a vacuum system where uh, all these beams are going through more than 120 uh, kilometers. It is built underground because you don't want to be bothered by seismic noise created on the surface. So you typically do it a few hundred meters underground. You have different towers here, and uh, because part of the interferometers are cryogenic, because if you cool the, the mirrors, you get uh, better performance out of these instruments. So this should give you an impression. And of course, then uh, the, this landscape that you see here is the south of the Netherlands, and uh, you would like to integrate it uh, in this uh, area. So this is the uh, timeline. And we have to make a decision on where to build it uh, at the end of 2024. So either Italy or the Netherlands, or maybe in uh, Saxony, if that uh, if that works out uh, for Germany. And many of the things that you need to do before choosing a site has to do with qualifying the site and making sure that it is suited to host uh, this uh, instrument. And then uh, uh, you have to um, estimate the cost, get the money together, build a governance structure, do all the engineering that you need to do, and then you can decide on that. And if all, everything works out, we should be doing uh, science in uh, the middle of, uh, of the next decade. So um, uh, the area that we think about is this new region Meuse Rhine. So that is this region over here, and it's located here. And uh, so this is Maastricht, Aachen, and Liège, so with, it's in uh, in this border region here. Essentially, we're looking at locations here. Now, the reason for that has to do with the uh, geology, because the uh, the oldest rock in the, in the Netherlands is coming to the surface at the, in the south of the Netherlands. And what we prefer for geology is that we can build the instrument in this rock, but then on top of that, we have something like, let's say, 50 meters, or and it's not that precise, of soft soil in order to uh, absorb the energy created on the surface by the cities of Aachen, Maastricht, uh, uh, Liège, etc. So we um, uh, may created a borehole to uh, measure if that uh, works. And indeed, if you, uh, this is the um, uh, PSD at the surface, you see the day night uh, differences. And we are interested in, uh, in, in frequencies here up to something like 10 Hertz, yeah, 10, 20 Hertz. So below frequencies. That is where we are limited by, by seismic noise. And, um, and you see that uh, from the power uh, point of view, um, this uh, geology is suppressing the, the noise power by uh, up to four orders of magnitude uh, during the day and about a factor of 200 during the night. Now, this is seismic noise, and we know how to handle seismic noise to some extent by making seismic isolation systems but uh, there is another noise source, and, it, and that is driven by the seismic noise, and it's called gravity gradient noise. So if you have your perfect mirror over here, and you isolate it from vibrations in the best way that you can, then if you have a seismic uh, disturbance going here, then you get this mass excess due to the compression, for example, and the mirror will be attracted to this mass uh, just because of the attraction, law of attraction by Newton. And when uh, these seismic fields are stochastic and fluctuating, then the mirror will start moving and start oscillating. And that is at low frequency, the dominant noise that we will face with, uh, with these instruments. And also, if you would be on the surface and you would have um, infrasound uh, or, or um, uh, atmospheric pressure variations because of temperature variations and clouds, things like that, that also would generate uh, uh, gravity gradient noise. We also call this Newtonian noise, and that is our biggest challenge. So electromagnetically, you would build a Faraday cage, but unfortunately for gravity, that is not possible. So um, uh, we try to go to an environment where this is as low as possible, and we look at uh, schemes to measure it and to try to subtract it from the data, to filter it out. So typically what we do is uh, we go to the surface, we put uh, arrays of uh, sensors, seismic sensors, also in boreholes we uh, put uh, sensors, 
And then uh, we use these arrays to um, uh, try to see where the noise, source, noise sources are. We, we can do that by beamforming. And we also uh, make a, an a image of the subsurface by that. Now, um, with that information, uh, so the ground layers, talking about depth, the wave velocities, the density models, and preferably also the damping factors, but that's not so uh, easy, we can make a model. And then uh, we uh, solve the wave equation um, in order to get the displacement field. And then that displacement field, we can integrate in order to calculate the effect, the acceleration of our mirrors. And that gives us the noise. So that is the scheme that we are following. So uh, we do uh, single station uh, parameters with three component um, uh, seismic sensors. We have these array studies, as I just uh, mentioned, and we do uh, a geological uh, modeling in order to try to understand the uh, subsurface. So I can show you some of the things that we did. Uh, we had a small array uh, over here. So um, uh, this is about one kilometer and this is half a kilometer. And uh, that allows us to uh, measure, um, say, uh, uh, around uh, two uh, hertz up to six hertz as the, as the maximum. And uh, we get a, a shallow subsurface model from this. And we know where the noise sources are, because when you can identify the noise sources, for example, if there is a bridge where cars are driving over, then we could filter that uh, more easily out. And we have medium sized uh, arrays uh, that we use. This is six by six kilometers. And again, uh, there uh, we cannot get at these higher frequencies anymore. So typically that works up to something uh, like uh, below two hertz. And, uh, and this also gives you a possibility to measure the subsurface uh, uh, deeper, uh, up to a kilometer. We do both uh, passive and active uh, studies. So um, um, uh, we did uh, at the surface and underground, the single stations, we measured the PSDs uh, on the surface and underground. We measured the horizontal to vertical spectral ratio. We tried to uh, uh, make a distinction between surface excitations and um, random body waves coming from all directions. We do beam forming, uh, measure uh, noise direction, uh, ready wave velocities. Uh, we uh, look at the different wave types. We make a 1D geo, uh, geological model up to 200 meters, also a uh, 2D uh, P wave model using active uh, seismic and then uh, reflections and uh, borer logging uh, with this way and uh, underground uh, sensors is what we have. Um, in the future, we uh, want to extend that. So uh, now we have only vertical seismic sensors at the surface, many of them in the array and only a few uh, that are uh, free component, and we want to use more free component uh, sensors and additional boreholes. So that is going on, and data analysis is uh, going on. So uh, typically here you see um, a measurement of this uh, horizontal to vertical uh, spectral ratio, and uh, you see it's uh, here around one. Oh, sorry, but around uh, four hertz, you see this uh, big amplification at the surface of the horizontal. And, uh, and that immediately already tells you that there is this soft soil layer lying on, on hard rock. You also see it in the rally electricity. And uh, there is also some indication of an additional bump over here. And we'll show you more about that. Um, so we, we, here you see the PSDs. And this is the frequency range that we are interested in from 0.1 to uh, 10 hertz. And uh, the uh, dash curves are the Peterson model, low noise and uh, high noise model. And uh, typically uh, around uh, one hertz, you see the, um, the effect uh, of um, uh, people, uh, anthropogenic noise. So uh, during the day, uh, you measure this noise at the surface. During the night, you measure less noise. And that's just because people are sleeping. And at depth, underground, 250 meter underground, during the day, it's the red uh, curve over here. And at night, you get the green thing here. Now, this is interesting because you can use that information also to try to extract the, uh, the body wave uh, uh, components. So what is always there and coming from all directions, uh, assuming that the attenuation of the soil is the same. You can use the day night ratio to say something about that. And this is the attenuation and power if you go uh, deeper as function of frequency. And you see here this factor of 10 to the fourth. Uh, suppression because of this geology. That is why we believe the geology is quite good. 
Here is another way to get at the uh, body wave contribution. And typically, if you have uh, horizontal waves uh, coming in, moving, and you have a sensor at the surface and a sensor at uh, at depth, then uh, the lag between the signals should be at zero time, zero time lag. And that is what you see happening here, but not always. You see it also uh, deviating uh, here at the uh, different frequencies. And that is a signal for um, uh, waves coming from different directions. And so that is what we then uh, in a crude way right now use to identify our body wave contribution. And uh, so while the total noise, for example, at the surface is, uh, is given here by this uh, purple curve, what you see, see here is what we extract for body wave uh, background. And then black is the total underground uh, uh, noise. So about 50% uh, of the noise is uh, what we think random uh, body waves. And we need to know that if we want to do our calculations of Newtonian noise, of gravity gradient noise. Another thing that we did is over a period of a year is we were detecting weak earthquakes. And um, so we detected in total about uh, 71 uh, of these uh, regional earthquakes. And we know that these interferometers, they, you cannot, uh, they see all earthquakes over the entire globe. But they unlock, you cannot operate them if the ground motion is uh, more than a micron uh, per second. So that if you exceed that velocity, then the control systems uh, cannot uh, control the interferometers anymore. And then you have to uh, relock the interferometer and you lose science time. And uh, so for uh, that location, we estimate that about 3% of the time uh, the interferometer will not work because of these regional earthquakes. This is um, uh, information from beamforming. So I give you two examples. So at 4 hertz, you see that the noise is uh, coming uh, from uh, this direction mostly. And uh, you can get the, the uh, wave speed uh, from that. But at 6 hertz, you see these two rings over here. So you see you have a fundamental mode and a higher order mode. And um, uh, that is important to know also, because if you look as function of depth for the different frequencies, then if you have a fundamental mode or a, uh, a first overtone, uh, then, then the attenuation is different and your, your Newtonian noise will change, your gravity gradient noise will change. So we, we calculated uh, that. Uh, then you can um, uh, look at the uh, phase velocities as function of, uh, of frequency. And what you see in here are also uh, the fundamental, but also the overtones are uh, visible in, uh, in these spectra. And uh, we see that uh, not only for the radio waves, we see it also for the love waves, we see the, the, uh, the overtones in, in that. So we can make uh, a nice uh, decomposition of, uh, of that. And then we form a uh, subsurface uh, model, and you can see that uh, over here. And that is done in the usual way, uh, trying all the parameters and uh, seeing which is uh, most um, fitting uh, the data. And typically, um, we uh, get a five layer model from that uh, with a different um, uh, density, different wave speeds, different thickness of the layers. And we see that the soft soil is typically a, a, a transition then from soft soil to hard rock that happens at 20 to 30 meters depth. Um, this is information from borehole uh, logging. So we did gamma ray logging, uh, uh, looking uh, at um, also uh, potassium, uh, uh, thorium, uranium, resistivity uh, logging, um, and, and uh, from that uh, trying to derive the P wave velocity, which is reasonably high. About, uh, uh, five kilometers. And here you see the lithology that we derived from, uh, from logging. Now, um, uh, so this gives you some, uh, so, some indication of what we have done. So all of that then is used in a, um, in a model. And uh, there we um, uh, uh, use that as, a, as boundary conditions, as input for the wave equation. Uh, and we try to solve the wave equation for uh, that uh, structure, that layered structure, and we excite uh, the, that uh, structure in a way that is consistent with what we measure from beam forming. Now then, that, uh, the solution of that uh, wave equation gives you the displacement fields. And once you know how all the mass elements are moving, you can calculate for every mass element what the attraction is of the mirror and how the mirror would move. 
and you integrate over the entire space. And that uh, then uh, yields you the Newtonian noise. And uh, so uh, we have um, uh, um, uh, written this down and recently uh, published uh, all of that. So both the seismic characterization and the calculation of the Newtonian noise. And this is important uh, in order to um, qualify that the, um, uh, that the site that we have is indeed uh, fulfilling um, uh, all these specifications that you need in order to realize Einstein telescope there. I think I'm out of time, uh, so I would like to uh, stop here. Yeah, thank you very much. Yo? Yeah. Um, let's see um, if we have some questions already. I don't see any questions from the audience at the moment. Diego, can you see any? Some no, people not at the moment. Sent, Maybe uh, some people is typing now. Yes. Maybe. Otherwise, well, we have five more minutes. I can show you some other things that we are doing. Mm -hmm. I'll leave that up to you. I would have some questions, but uh, what do okay. you think, Diego? A question just popped up. See. So I think it was uh, addressed to me and the presenter, so you cannot see it, Rita, but I can read okay. uh, the question for you. So you have addressed the noise problem. What happened to the idea of measurements with satellites that have low noise and potentially a large aperture? Yeah, that is a, a very good question. So there is a, a, a mission which is approved by ESA, the European Space Agency, and the mission is called LISA, Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. So that is a gravitational wave detector where you, um, also in the form of a triangle, where you launch three satellites and you put them millions of uh, kilometers apart and you send laser beams from one satellite to the other. Now, what happens is if you um, increase the distances between the, the satellites, so millions of kilometers compared to uh, ten, tens of kilometers for the case that we are discussing right now, is that you automatically move to low frequency. And that uh, space antenna, so which is approved, it's an order of 2 billion euro project. It will be launched in 2034, and we hopefully we can measure together with Einstein telescope. That uh, instrument will measure gravitational waves um, um, below the frequencies lower than a million watts. So essentially, these are the, the more massive black holes that you find in galaxies. And you can look at the merging of these uh, type of black holes. Or you have a, a supermassive black hole with a smaller black hole orbiting it. And then with very high precision, you can map out space time around uh, such a massive black hole and study the signs there. So this is an approved mission, and it, um, the difficulty is, of course, you have to launch uh, three satellites, and if you make a mistake, then it's too bad. You cannot repair anything anymore. You cannot reach it. It's too far away. And the good uh, thing is, is that um, uh, you already have your vacuum. You're not bothered by uh, seismic noise. You can work with uh, a few uh, watts of uh, laser power. And, um, and since what you measure is a delta L over L, if you uh, make your length very large, you immediately already get very high precision. Thank you. By the way, this question from uh, was uh, from uh, Keith Horner, and uh, I'm unmuting him in case he wants to interact. No, thank you. It's clear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Okay, uh, I see some more questions now. Um, there was one, was it from Elmer? Um, the question is, uh, how is the source location done for the gravitational waves uh, that are detected only at a single site? Yeah, so um, th that is also a good question because uh, with the current detectors that we have, the LIGO and the Virgo detector, if you have only one detector and uh, one L, you cannot uh, determine the source location. It's impossible. 
Um, if, on the other hand, with uh, Einstein telescope, you have such a sensitivity that your signal, you can measure it uh, during hours and maybe even during a day. Yeah? So you constantly have that signal. And then the Earth rotation is motivating uh, what you are uh, looking at. And you can use that information already to say something about pointing. But what we do uh, for Einstein telescope is that we have multiple interferometers in uh, the same device and uh, they have different antenna patterns because there is also an antenna pattern that they have to take into account and that allows us to um, uh, to do um, a location um, at the end what what uh, we we hope will happen is that we get a global network so right now we have a network detectors in the us detector in europe a detector in Japan, and there will also be a detector is under construction in India. And in the future, uh, there are also plans to build uh, these interferometers, big ones in the United States. And, and there is an ambition to do this uh, also in Australia. And then you would have again a global network. You uh, can do uh, triangulation with uh, three detectors, and you can use the antenna patterns and the fact that the Earth rotates. And that allows you to uh, pinpoint sources with an accuracy of one square degree, which is for astronomical <laughs> precision is nothing. It's really terrible for astronomers, but that's the best we can do. Okay, thanks very hey, much. I'm also unmuting Elmer if he wants to. Uh, yeah, thanks, very, uh, very clear. So many ways uh, in the future. Uh, maybe one thing then, so the, the one that reached the news, I think that was uh, located with only one um, device or one antenna or one place. Um, was then the uh, location done together with uh, electromagnetic detection or no, no. how was it found out that it was that specific uh, black hole merger? Yeah, no, the, you know, the first event that we detected was a black hole merger, and there were two detectors that saw it. And then you can, um, yeah, you can do triangulation with two detectors, but you will get a band on the sky. And uh, so that was the first one. Um, but th these were black holes and nobody could see anything electromagnetically. Uh, because a black hole is made out of vacuum, out of space time, so there are no atoms to create any light. The uh, other event that was very exciting was in 2017, in August 2017, and that was a collision of two neutron stars. But then we had three detectors. We had LIGO, the two LIGO detectors, and Virgo in Europe. And with that, we could do triangulation to precision of uh, 16 square degrees, so 1-6 square degrees. And then it took astronomers about an hour to find the counterpart in that. But they were in that in that um, uh, uh, part of of the sky uh, at a distance of uh, let's say 120 light years a million light years there were 50 galaxies they had to go through all of them one by one amazing interesting um, I was uh, something related, if I may. I was wondering from this uh, just continuous signal, uh, how do you, uh, it, it, it's short events, is it? So, how do you find those events in your uh, signal? Yeah, that's, uh, that, yeah, so the, the uh, event, so when uh, a black hole, when two black holes are rotating, they emit gravitational waves, but we cannot see that because we only start measuring around 10 hertz. So it's only the last part when they merge together, and that that takes less than a second. So typically we get a burst of radiation of uh, about that takes a second, and that uh, is a chirp. So it means it goes from low frequency up to high frequency. So the, the the two neutron stars went up to more than a kilohertz, and the first event went up to something like 150 hertz. Now then you can do two things. So one thing is you just uh, uh, look at uh, coincidences in time and in energy and things like that and look at consistency. So that is one type of analysis. It's a very fast analysis to find interesting triggers. The other thing that you can do is um, you can uh, solve the Einstein equations and do that on supercomputers and find these waveforms. So there, there are very specific waveforms 
when two black holes are merging. So uh, it's like they they wiggle uh, first, and then they they get a, a chirp, uh, so it goes up in frequency and in amplitude in a specific way. Then uh, you get something very complicated in the merger, and then a deformed black hole is ringing down to its final state. So with quasi normal mod. So you can solve the the answer and equations for all these possibilities, make a template bank and with millions of templates, and then shift them over the data and try to find uh, if one is matching uh, what you, what you see. And then so that is uh, another way of analysis. They also found the event, and then once you have the event, you start doing um, uh, supercomputer calculations in order to really get at the parameters. What are the masses of the black holes? How much are they spinning, et cetera? And it's a Bayesian type of analysis. Okay. Maybe when you have uh, a lot of these events, uh, you could also train a network uh, to do some kind of pattern recognition and detect them automatically. What do you think? Yeah, I think we have about, uh, so there are thousands of people in our collaboration. We have about 100 working on uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and, and doing all kinds of things like that. We are very careful because we, we use it uh, in order to look at data quality, but we okay. don't use it yet in our analysis because it's so difficult. They are very um, uh, successful, these routines, but it's very difficult to quantify how successful and what is the precision of, uh, of what, why do they find these uh, type of solutions. And yeah, in physics, if you give a, a number, you all, always have to give the error bar on the number that is still uh, work in progress. Even for detection? No, for the, for the detection, we can do that. But uh, then the final analysis, uh, that is something else. Of course. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, I see some other questions from the audience. Uh, there's one from Eric Kleiss. He's asking, uh, the size of the Einstein telescope is similar to LIGO. So what makes it more sensitive, particularly to the lower frequencies? Yeah, so we, we do a couple of things. So, um, uh, first of all, by going underground, you see already that the seismic noise is tremendously reduced and also the Newtonian noise is reduced. Then we uh, take uh, mirrors, which are right now the a mirror is 40 centimeters and about in diameter and about 40 kilograms. We go to several hundreds of kilograms mirrors, which means that the thermal vibrations, which also put a limit, on the sensitivity will become less. Um, we are using um, uh, manipulated um, uh, vacuum states, squeezed vacuum states, in order to uh, beat uh, the, the quantum limit on, on the precision. So it essentially entangle photons in the interferometers. Uh, we cool the test masses, which we don't do in LIGO and Virgo right now. Um, so there, there are many of these different uh, um, uh, things that all have to come together. But indeed, um, the if you go from um, um, four kilometer to 10 kilometer, that is a factor of two and a half that you get. But uh, then we also have six interferometers at, one, at once in one setup, where three of these interferometers are completely optimized for the low frequency. And that means, for example, one of the things that is bothering you at low frequency is that you would like to put in as much photons as possible because with a lot of photons, you can do higher precision because your shot noise goes down. But at low frequencies, this has the effect that these photons will start hitting your mirror and you get quantum pressure on the mirror and that gives you a certain noise. So the low frequency detector, we try to do with very little power and the high frequency with a lot of power. So we optimize the two instruments for the two frequency regions. And that at the end uh, gives you an order of magnitude improvement compared to the design uh, sensitivity of LIGO, but LIGO did not reach yet the design sensitivity. And then if you get an order of magnitude, the amount of events that you get goes with the cube. So it immediately means thousand times more events. Diego, do you want to unmute Eric? Done, Eric, if you want to comment back. They can't hear him, maybe later. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> There's a glitch here. 
Uh, th thank you for your answer. Um, looking at the noise uh, curves, I was looking if you can make your noise 10 times smaller than uh, you go directly to a bit lower frequencies. But the other aspect I was wondering about, if your noise level goes down by a factor 10 or maybe a factor 100, uh, you can use 10 or 100 times uh, more bounces between your mirrors, which makes your effective length of your interferometer about 10 or 100 times longer. I is that more or less the mechanism I have to think about? Yeah, that's what we do. What we um, the the arms. So I, I said we have a beam splitter and the laser is split up in two arms. But actually, the arms there's not only an end mirror, but there's also an input mirror in the arm. So um, uh, while the the arm of LIGO, for example, is uh, four kilometers long, because you have an input and an end mirror, you make a cavity and you store the uh, uh, the uh, photons in a faber pro cavity. And essentially, the, the finesse of that cavity is about 450. And so you amplify uh, the length by, by um, about a factor of 400. And, and that gives you uh, immediately better sensitivity. Now, the thing is, you cannot uh, uh, go on forever doing that. Because at some point, the, if you uh, store the photons too long in the cavity, then the gravitational wave has, for example, a frequency, let's say, of 1 kilohertz. And you store uh, the photons longer than uh, than a millisecond. You start averaging out. You know, over the lifetime, uh, the photons are too long in the in the cavity, yeah? and the gravitational wave uh, signal gets averaged away. So that means that if you so to the the maximum that you could do, if you want to be sensitive up to a kilohertz, is maybe go to something like forty kilometer long uh, instrument on Earth. And, and then with uh, high finesse, I think that is what the Americans are contemplating right now. And that is already for um, uh, some of the science for the colliding neutron stars. This is already not good. And you are averaging, you store the photons too long. Yeah, I, I understand. I mean, if you have too many bounces, you know, it effectively makes it longer, but then your integration time is more. So <laughs> yeah. your your high frequency uh, cutoff uh, moves down. Exactly. But on the low, frequ low frequency side, you gain more. So yeah. that's maybe why you have two different optimized systems in there. Exactly. Yeah, that is. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, there is another question from Elmar. Um, and that is, I reformulated a bit um, for, for the three different sites that are being considered uh, in the south of Limburg and Sardinian, and maybe also the one in Saxony. How do the levels of Newtonian noise compare? Yeah, that is. Uh, <laughs> in, um, Say that already. Yeah, that's very de debated right now. And um, the uh, site in Saxony and uh, the site in the Netherlands are kind of similar where you have a hard rock and it's soft soil layer on top. In Sardinia, it's uh, granite all the way up to the top. And um, so it depends a bit. So if you uh, um, take a hammer and you hit on top of uh, the, the granite, then of course, uh, below you will, there is not much attenuation in, in granite. Um, so that is a worry. So you have to do detailed calculation. Then we are in the middle of uh, discussions. Uh, we just published our results, but uh, it is um, all heavily debated at the moment. And of course, that is, if you uh, advocate a site, that is where the arguments will lie. So I guess it if, becomes a political discussion as well. No, the site uh, decision at the end uh, will also be, will, will be taken uh, uh, by politicians uh, at the level of ministries. But of course, you have to uh, guarantee that your site can do the science. Otherwise, it's immediately over. Right. So you can see that we are in need of uh, lots of advice from uh, geophysicists. Because the, essentially the, the whole seismic uh, performance, the Newtonian noise, the consequences for Newtonian noise, but also the consequences for underground construction. If it turns out that uh, to construct it uh, at one location is, you know, a factor of two more expensive than somewhere else or more risky, that also will have an impact. Right. Maybe Elma wants to comment again. Can you unmute him, Diego? Done. 
Okay, yeah, thanks. I think uh, that's clear again. I just need to wait then uh, until uh, the people from Sardinia publish something. I haven't seen something coming out of that, but it's it's great to see that your work is out. So I see the dual dual eyes, and I will uh, I will right. mark them. Yeah. You see, I, I know maybe you know uh, uh, Bjorn Vink, who is a geophysicist. You might know Alexander Kampman, who is uh, in geophysics at Shell. So, uh, I forgot actually yeah, nice to mention that in, in my introduction, Xander was the one who put us in contact. So thanks, Xander, yeah. for that. Yeah, it, it's great to have uh, this uh, the kind of collaboration because I come from the field of subatomic physics. So I have no background in uh, geophysics and uh, many. So we put uh, uh, PhD students on on, uh, on this project and that forces everybody <laughs> to, uh, to uh, start understanding that. But we, it is great, and I, we appreciate a lot of the help uh, from Alexander and uh, from Björn. So I see one more question here, uh, which you have partly answered, I think, and we have five minutes, six minutes over time now. Maybe we can just ask that question quickly. Yeah, that's fine. So, yeah. So uh, the question is, and I can't see who it comes from, unless it comes from you, Diego. Uh, how are the black hole masses determined from the merit signal? Is it done by some kind of inversion process? No, that is um, uh, uh, in, uh, in principle, you, you already can understand this from uh, Kepler's law. So if you, um, uh, what, what we measure is uh, the frequency of uh, revolution of that system and we can measure the change of frequency, so the derivative, the FDT. And uh, these two, that information, if you look at, for example, Kepler's law, you already can get the masses uh, from. And um, for example, if you would have uh, two objects of one and a half solar mass, uh, typical neutron stars, then at merger, when they touch, uh, they uh, would have a frequency of one and a half kilohertz. And, and by looking that the signal was around 150 hertz when, when it stopped right, at the maximum, we immediately uh, know that this were, these were black holes. And then this is not, of course, how we do the analysis. Then we start uh, uh, cranking supercomputers in order to make uh, the uh, calculated waveforms and compare uh, the waveforms to the data. And then you can uh, uh, look at the mass ratios, you can look at the spins of the objects, and at the end, uh, you, and you get a distance uh, on the amplitude and things like that. So it's just a whole uh, parameter um, inference that you, that you do. Okay. And I see now the question came from Jos van der Feken. Uh, Diego, would yeah, you like to I'm on some meeting. Yeah. I've done that. Yeah, th thank you for your answer. Yeah, that's clear. So, so basically, it's uh, you do forward modeling and try to match it with, uh, with the observed uh, waveform. Is it is not not really an inversion? No, they, they, no. For the waveforms, not. No, you uh, you make a grid of calculations, and uh, then at some point you can interpolate. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, I think all the questions from the audience uh, have been answered for now. Uh, Diego, I will hand it over to you to uh, for, for some closing remarks, if you like. Sure. So, yes, I want uh, to thank again uh, uh, Professor van der Brandt for uh, his uh, presentation and for the lovely discussion, a lot of interesting uh, comments there. Uh, I want to thank uh, Rita for co-hosting with me the event, all the AG communities uh, that uh, participated uh, with, with us. And uh, of course, all the other members uh, that uh, uh, again uh, are uh, co continuously supporting our uh, events with their participation. And uh, yeah, and uh, finally, I also thank Aramco for providing the platform uh, of WebEx uh, for uh, for this talk. So I guess uh, we can uh, conclude here. Uh, I will stop uh, recording the meeting. Uh, if anybody wants to stay a little bit longer, is uh, is also welcome. And uh, for the rest, a good evening.
and uh, we will see you next year. So for uh, whom is going to vacation, happy vacation and uh, see you soon. Thank you.